Bank.com or call 800-282-3333. Encounter Jesus, experience grace at Olivet Lutheran Church. We offer multiple styles of worship services. Our Sunday morning 8.30 worship is filled with traditional hymns led by the organ. If contemporary music is more your style, the Sunday morning 10.30 service will be what you're looking for. And our Wednesday 6 p.m. service is quiet, contemplative, and acoustic. Worship with us online on our YouTube channel. To find out more, visit olivet.org. Encounter Jesus, experience grace at Olivet Lutheran Church. Weather and Ag in Focus on WGAY Radio. And welcome to Weather and Ag in Focus, 106 in the afternoon. I want to thank everybody for joining us on this cloudy day. Uh, some snow showers up in the Northern Valley. In fact, uh, areas up around Grand Forks, uh, seeing a little bit of a slippery travel up there today. And again, back edge of the snow showers should be moving eastward, east of the valley by around 3 o'clock or so when conditions will start to improve. Not looking for much here in the FM area, but uh, we are looking at uh, at least some scatters, more, a few, few more scattered snow showers uh for our area for the early part of the afternoon but justin you guys got a little bit more up to the north yeah we got a little light dusting of snow and some uh sleet a little freezing drizzle last night that produced some slick roads on the uh, the interstate 29 north of hillsborough up to the canadian border in fact a lot of ice or partially snow covered roads up here in the northern valley over towards the devil's lake basin and then some scattered ice and snow stretching all the way down towards bismarck as well as dickinson so looks like the southern valley escaped just about all of it with an exception for just a a few flakes flying and dancing through the skies right now that's a bit yeah that's about it there's a couple of pockets of some uh, more moderate snow showers at least briefly out around daisy uh, also one uh, little batch right west of Valley City. Uh, some light snow stretching from about Galesburg up through uh, just north of Mayville and then just north of Grand Forks, Grand Forks um, uh, and areas northwest of Grand Forks, uh, even up towards the Canadian border. If you have any plans on 29 uh, going north of Grand Forks up through uh, up to the Canadian border, uh, some slippery travel, some uh, slightly... I'll call it more moderate snow showers up there where we could see some light accumulation and yeah, just enough to kind of grease up the roadways. But everybody else, just a lot of clouds, a lot of clouds around this week, too. We're not looking at a whole lot uh, in the way of sunshine until later this week. Uh, towards the tail end of the week, we'll start to see increasing amounts of sunshine. But the good news about this week, A, there's no big storms and B, We're looking at temperatures above normal all week long into the 20s and 30s. And we're going to keep that stretch of 20s and 30s, mainly 30s, all the way through the weekend and probably into early next week, which uh, rounds out the month of January already. Man, yeah, we're turning the corner into February, but we're ending January on a relatively nice note. Yeah, it sure is. Uh, it's pretty nice. And unfortunately, when we get these uh, really nice, pleasant temperatures in the middle of winter, you usually get uh, ice to follow with it and has been the trend with a lot of these little system with the pockets of some freezing mist and drizzle and sleet. And it, I'm sure people would agree it's been more than years past. Well, we're typically just not this warm in the middle of winter. And that's part and part why we're seeing more of these little uh I don't want to call, I guess you could call them nuisance little systems or little disturbances that come through and produce just a little bit of slick travel around the area. And we've got, uh, we've got, uh, some giveaways this week. We've got boat show tickets. Uh, Mm -hmm. we're going to try and give away a rain gauge probably tomorrow. So you want to be listening for that tomorrow, but we'll have a couple days this week where we'll give away, uh, some boat show tickets and, uh, it's uh, it it kind of puts you in the mood that you know what? All right, summer's not that far away, you know. <laughs> so you, it's you know the these dead of winter uh, summer events, I'll call them, boat show being one of them. It uh, it makes you look forward to what's around the corner. Well, there's really not a whole lot of ice out there. You could probably get out there here pretty soon in a boat. Yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> uh, I'm telling. So you. here's the thing: Have you heard from anyone? 
on ice thicknesses around the area yeah. since we've had that cold snap? Because, I mean, there were a lot of spots that really had thin ice and even a few lakes that weren't completely frozen yeah. over a couple weeks ago. Well, I heard out of Devil's Lake, uh, it was uh, up to 15 to 19 inches. Um, so that's better news. Uh, if you have any yeah. ice reports uh, of any local lakes around the area, give us a call. Uh, 701-293-9000, 701-293-9000. I know up at Lake of the Woods, um, they're at about 19 inches, the last I heard up there. Uh, so great news. You know, you'd like it a little thicker than that this time of the year. But uh, all in all, I mean, uh, it th that definitely helped out a lot because we were, if I'm not mistaken, right around nine inches on some of those lakes um, before we got the cold snap. So uh, it added a good six to ten inches across uh, some of the area, so that's good news there. I mean, right. <laughs> yeah. there's a lot of uh, fishing tournaments coming up, and I'm thinking uh, one in particular that I'm sure a handful of people from around this area have or go to often, and that's the the JC's Ice Fishing Extravaganza on Hole in the Day Bay on Gull Lake, Central Minnesota. Uh, it'd be interesting to know how much ice they have down there, because last I heard which I haven't asked for a couple of weeks, the main body of Gaul hadn't completely frozen over, but I know that the bays had some ice on it, but they need, I think the sheriff department wants 20, it's either 18 or 20 inches of ice right. before they'll allow that to, to go on. And that's coming up here quick. That's usually in the middle of February that they host that event. So if you have any details on that, um, again, ice conditions around the area, 701-293-9000 is the Red Wing Shoes phone line, as well as our email inboxes, weather or ag at flagfamily.com. And Dean, do you have any plans on going ice fishing this season yet? Because you haven't been out yet. Have I you? have not been out yet this year. Um, you know, no plans as of now. It's usually kind of a last minute thing. My Mm -hmm. One of my good friends from high school, he lives down um, a little closer to the cities, and he does a lot of tours. He'll he'll go out and do uh, ice fishing tours. So uh, I'm waiting for him to give me a buzz. <laughs> we we had a we had a nice little uh, a nice little outing up at Borderview Lodge a couple a uh, couple of years ago, and I'll tell you what, it was so much fun. Um, it, I mean, it was basically it was Cadillac ice fishing. It really was. You could sit in there in your shorts and and just stick the bowl in the water and we were constantly getting fish so um like to get out before the winter is done uh, you know hopefully we'll see if not then yeah well we'll hit it next year <laughs> we'll hit right. it next year and here's something and i sent you this article i don't know if you had a chance to read it justin but um if i just sent it to you a few minutes ago uh <laughs> so yeah so you probably haven't el nino has been in effect obviously and that's just one of the pieces of the puzzle with I'm sure if you're a, a an avid listener that you know that the LRC is is the central piece of the puzzle. But the El, you know El Nino conditions do have um, an impact on our, on our winter. There's no doubt about it. Uh, each El Nino is different, and uh, same with La Nina. And all signs are pointing now to uh, El Nino weakening, almost becoming neutral here by spring, and by next winter, uh, we're getting early indications now that a possible strong La Nina will develop. Now, again, every La Nina is different, but if you remember last winter when we had all the snow, we were in uh, a pretty strong La Nina. So it'll be interesting to see how that pans out as we had not only throughout uh, our growing season with El Nino weakening, that is actually pretty good news, uh, but then La Nina conditions will start to develop as we head into uh, fall and then uh, for next winter as well. Something yeah, to uh, keep an eye on. Bring on the snow, man. You know what I always say. <laughs> I Let it snow. <laughs> we just, just haven't had much. I mean, and, and just, ju you posted an article last week, Justin, on just how many. Uh, uh, and if you want to see that article, WDAYRadioNow.com, on, on just how little snow we've not only just here in the FM area, but uh, in the areas of Minnesota. Uh, and areas down to our south, they've been the target zone. But some of those areas have picked up uh, quite a bit of snow, much more than we've had so far this winter. Uh, not not great news for the snowmobilers, that's for sure. Um, but the general public, I don't hear too many complaints out there. And I don't see any signs of that changing. You know, according yeah, to the yeah, you really don't either, Dean. Yeah, according to the LRC, we do have a couple of those wild card storms that won that hit uh, at Christmas time. 
uh, what happens when that comes back next month? How is that going to, you know, how's that going to act in our area? Is it going to be a, a, a big system uh, at, or is it, uh, is it going to be in a weaker version? So we'll have to wait and see how that pans out. But um, I'm starting to see, when was it? That was like what, the f- end of the first week, end of the second week of February, Justin? That uh, Christmas the one? Christmas our, one, Our yeah. ice storm? Yeah. The big Yeah. Wait. Well, when was that? Would be uh, I. I, th- I want to say that that's the seventh uh, and eighth of February. Okay. I'm pretty sure. All right, because uh, we're starting to get some indications of it's around that time when we're going to start to see another pattern change, and uh, our models are just starting to hint at a huge, a possible huge storm entering the Pacific, uh, entering the West Coast. How uh, huge is it? It, it? it looked pretty big. Uh, oh. Right around that first week in February, which would about put it on target for our area by around that sixth and seventh time frame. So, um, if you're you know if if you're wanting more active weather, that would be our uh, I call it the wild card storm because that was a pretty significant storm. And odds are, usually when it comes through on the on the next cycle, it's It'll usually different. Yeah, usually. it's usually a little bit different. So, but we yeah. do and. Even the one that uh, we on our calendar, if you've been paying attention, uh, we got a line on the uh, 23rd, 24th, and 25th, and that's tomorrow, Wednesday, and Thursday. And, you know, we were expecting that to be one of our possibly, well, it was likely for that to return, but it could have given us some wintry impacts up here. And that's coming through as two waves of energy to our south through Mm -hmm. Iowa, southern Minnesota, Illinois, and Wisconsin, bringing rain, ice, and snow to them uh, Wednesday and Thursday and Thursday night. So it's coming in uh, about a day late from when we were expecting it, but just south of our area, which is good news for us because we don't need to worry about another another big ice rain mess that was uh, right around Christmas time. So thankfully we're not dealing with that. But as you were alluding to Dean, we do have a guest coming up Mm -hmm. uh, in our next segment. That's going to be Dr. Guy Collins. He's an extension from, uh, I believe South Carolina and he's a specialist or a specialty in cotton. So he's going to be joining us in our next segment. And if you want to join and ask some questions regarding cotton, anything about it, feel free to do so by giving us a call on the Red Wing Shoes phone line. That's 701-293-9000. Or again, our inboxes, which are weather or ag at flagfamily.com. We're going to get caught up with the American Ag Network. And we, we, when we return, we'll be... Uh, joined by Guy Collins. Again, that's North Carolina Extension Cotton Specialist. Livestock market is mixed but mostly lower this afternoon. For the American Ag Network, I'm Richard Risvet with this market update. After running into long-term resistance levels late last week, live cattle futures are skeptical of trading too boldly. Thankfully, this week's slaughter is expected to be more aggressive as packers will have the full week to process cattle and stronger box beef prices should encourage them even more. Friday's cattle on feed report isn't having much of an effect on the market as traders deem the report's data as pretty much neutral, but looking for strong demand factors or an uptick in the cash market to spark prices higher. Last week's negotiated cash cattle trade was disappointing as very few cattle traded, but of the few cattle that did trade, northern dress cattle sold for 272 to 277, mostly at 274. That is $1 higher than the previous week. Southern live cattle traded for mostly 173. That is also $1 higher than the week before. The week's volume of negotiated cash cattle sales totaled 37,348 head, of which 87% are committed for nearby delivery, while the remaining 13% are for deferred. Box beef prices are higher. Choice up 231 and select up two bucks with a movement of 41 loads. Now, like the cattle complex, the lean hog market has been off to a slow start today. Midday carcass price is well supported as most of the cuts are seeing better interest and therefore higher prices. We'll get a look at the livestock numbers next. You're listening to the American Ag Network. When news happens in agriculture or when the markets are moving, we've got you covered as your trusted voice in agriculture. The team at the American Ag Network has the knowledge and experience to keep you informed on the issues impacting farmers and ranchers. We've got you covered on air, online, and on demand. Find the American Ag Network on your favorite social media platforms and also follow the American Ag Today podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We are the American Ag Network. 
Make sure to subscribe to the Market Talk YouTube channel. You can watch our latest interviews with top market analysts in the country, find bonus content, and much more. It's easy. Just go to youtube.com slash at Market Talk Egg and hit the subscribe button. Or you can search for Market Talk Egg on YouTube. Get the latest bonus interviews, exclusive content, and more with the American Ag Today podcast. Just search for American Ag Today and give us a follow wherever you get your podcasts. Let's get a look at the livestock numbers. Live cattle February down 35 at 17402. April down 15 at 17722. June up 22 at 17455. And the August live cattle there up 20 at 17497. Feeders January down 12 at 229.97. March down 37 at 231.57. Lean hogs February up 20 at 70.95. April down 15 at 78 even. And the May lean hogs, they're down 47 at 83.50. The Dow right now is up almost 100 points. The dollar sits at 103.1 with crude oil trading up over two bucks at right around $75.5 a barrel. For the American Ag Network, I'm Richard Ristvet. Weather and Ag in Focus on WDAY Radio. And welcome back to Weather and Ag in Focus. Thanks for rejoining us. It's 121 on this Monday afternoon. And if you want to join in on the conversation, uh, give us a call on the Red Wing Shoes phone line, 701-293-9000. We're bringing in our guest now. This is going to be Dr. Guy Collins, North Carolina Extension Cotton Specialist. And Guy, how are you doing? Thanks for joining us today. I'm doing well. Thank you. And I appreciate you having me. Yeah, not a problem at all. Well, tell me a little bit about yourself, Guy, uh, a little bit of your backstory, what it is you do and how you got to where you're at today. Okay, well, I, my name is Guy Collins. I'm a cotton specialist with NC State University. Um, I grew up in eastern North Carolina on a, my family farm, and we raised peanuts, cotton, a little bit of corn, a little bit of wheat, and we also had some cattle. And um, from there, I went to school. Um, let me back up. When I was 16 years old, I worked for a crop consultant and that's where my passion for cotton really began. And then I pursued all of my degrees at NC State University in agronomy. I did several internships and fresh out of graduate school, I was a cotton specialist at the University of Georgia in Tifton, Georgia. And in 2015, I was fortunate enough to move back home uh, to my alma mater uh, as a cotton specialist here. So that's where I am today. And Guy, uh, I mean, obviously up here, there's, you know, nobody raising cotton this far north. Uh, Just a little too warm. Yeah, right. Um, So for people that don't know how, how how actually do you plant uh, and also harvest cotton as well? All right. So cotton starts with cotton seed and we use basic commercial planters, uh, most of which is anywhere from six to 12 row. Uh, planters. Uh, so we plant cotton seed. Cotton seed is very expensive. It's one of the, the greatest inputs that we have in production of cotton. And right now in our part of the world, uh, a bag of seed is running about 600 to $650. Whoa. And that'll cover about 5.2 acres or so. Uh, so you're looking at north of $100 an acre to, to, to plant cotton. Um, so that's how it gets started. And in, in, in our state, we tend to plant somewhere between 40 to 44,000 seed per acre, uh, depending on conditions. Uh, cotton is very sensitive to cool weather early in its life cycle. So we, we want to make sure our, our seeding rates are precise and our placement of seed is, is as precise as we can get it. And from there, we let it grow. <clears throat> um, there are several inputs that, that go into it all year long. Uh, and then lastly, we, we finished with harvest. All cotton is machine harvested now. There is a mixture of what we call basket pickers, uh, at least in our part of the world, uh, and uh, baler pickers. So the baler pickers are more modern. Uh, they actually store cotton in round modules, which equates to a, a little bit over uh, four bales, cotton bales, which is 500 pounds of lint. Uh, so these, these are very large bales. They weigh about 5,000 pounds each, and we call that a module. Uh, from there, it goes to the gin and is ginned uh, to remove the seed. Uh, and that makes about four cotton bales, which are 500 pounds each. Hmm. Now, you said they're sensitive to the cold. 
Um, you guys do get your occasional cold snaps down there. So after after the uh, the plant is a little more mature, um, what do you do if if you guys do see a a hard freeze coming your way? Would that affect the cotton much after it's after it's a little more mature? It could. So uh, what you're talking about is is a freeze towards the end of the season. Um, and that, that can happen on occasion because we're at the northern end of the East Coast cotton belt. Uh, there's a little bit grown in Virginia, but we're kind of at the northern tip of, of the eastern cotton belt along the Atlantic. Uh, so typically we like to defoliate cotton, which is us getting chemically removing the, the leaves uh, and trying to open the bowls, which is the harvestable fruit on cotton. And uh, we, we try to accelerate a natural process is essentially what we're doing. So that natural pro- process is called senescence, where the plant ripens, just like you see leaves turning colors in the fall, and then eventually they'll fall off. We're trying to accelerate that natural process to do it in somewhat warmer temperatures before freeze can occur. So for us, on average, our first frost date would be somewhere between October 20th and November the 5th. Um, Typically, we say the end of October. Uh, Occasionally, we'll get surprised and we'll have an early freeze uh, somewhere, you know, maybe October the 3rd or the 5th or something like that. That would be a rare scenario. Um, But yeah, it can cause problems if the the crop is not quite mature enough uh, to be harvested or is not quite ready for defoliation. So when you get to that that point where you're uh, accelerating the defoliation of it, if you get that frost in there, it, it's just going to stop the maturity of the plant, right? Or it could kill the plant. But what about the cotton itself? Is that susceptible to the cold or does it, if the cotton's on there, does it just not matter if it freezes or gets too cold as long as it's reached that certain point where it's ready to be harvested? As as long as the bowls or the harvestable bowls are mature, uh, in many cases, uh, frost doesn't necessarily hurt anything. Uh, So some bowls that remain closed and then it freezes, say, surprisingly. Uh, What that can often do is if that bowl is mature, it can actually help it pop open. Uh, If it's not quite mature enough, the problem we run into is it's very high in moisture. And if a a frost, if, if it's severe enough, can actually freeze those bowls shut to where they're not harvested. But as far as the quality of the lint goes, not necessarily. It doesn't really affect much at all. And it's I co- see. So then, go ahead, go Justin. Ahead, Dean. <laughs> go ahead. So when are you putting seed in the ground? What time of the year are you looking at uh, at planting for soil temperatures being the right temperature? And then what point or is a good date that you're trying to get out to harvest? You said that that frost usually comes in around the end of October. So I'd imagine you're probably trying to wrap up by then, correct? That is correct. So to to begin with, I'll I'll discuss planting. Typically, our temperatures are somewhat suitable when we get to late April or early May. Um, For most Folks, it's going to be the month of May is when we're planting cotton. Now, during that time, it is not uncommon to encounter some cold snaps. So what what often happens is we'll plant some cotton while conditions are good. And if a cold snap comes in, we'll take a break for two or three days or however long uh, that we need. And then we resume planting as soon as those conditions are favorable again. Uh, so in most years, it's not uncommon at all to experience some sort of cold snap. Uh, but by the time we get to mid-May, it, typically the odds of having a cold snap then are, are fairly low. So normally planting progress is, is, is largely underway at that point. And so we, we typically plant till May 25th. That's our first crop insurance deadline for planting cotton. And the final deadline is at the very end of May. Uh, so we, we try not to plant beyond the end of May if we can help it. And in most cases, we're able to, to, to plant that very timely. As far as harvest goes, uh, we typically start defoliating our earliest crop, um, usually late September. And defoliation can continue on to the mid-October, sometimes the third week in October. So we like to be completely defoliated by the time a frost would occur. 
Uh, so at that point, you know, as long as the defoliants are working and the bowls are opening, uh, then we can proceed with harvest in essentially the same order. Uh, sometimes we do have hiccups with weather, you know, mainly tropical storms, things like that. But we hope to avoid those uh, the best we can. <laughs> and, and Guy, is this something that could be raised in, I mean, in our climate up here in North Dakota, Minnesota area? You could probably grow a plant um, for ornamental or decorative purposes. Right. It would be very difficult to grow it as a as a commodity and and to be profitable doing so. So cotton is, is more of a tropical type plant. Uh, it needs warm weather. Uh, it needs other things like most other crops do, sure. like timely rainfall, things of that nature. Uh, but we do have to have a certain degree of heat uh, to, to be able to produce that crop. Not only that, uh, you also have to have the infrastructure uh, the, to grow cotton and uh, commercially, and that would include gins and warehouses and things of that nature. Right. Is it is it a pretty good drought tolerant crop to raise? So cotton is thought to be a drought tolerant crop. Yes. Okay. That does not mean that it is not responsive to water and sure. does not need water. So. We, we can, in some years, see a very big difference in irrigated cotton versus dry land cotton. This past year was a prime example of that. We were hit very hard in August with some severe heat and drought, and that, that punished yields in, in a lot of cases. Uh, so we do need water, and we need timely water. We don't need uh, very much water at any given time, mm -hmm. and having too much water is a bad thing just as well. Right. So... Uh, you know, cotton is very responsive to irrigation water, but in general, it's thought to be more drought tolerant than a lot of your other crops like corn and, and soybeans and sure. things like that. Okay. Well, Guy, we're at the bottom of the hour, so we have to go to uh, American Ag Network real quick. Uh, but when we come back, uh, we'll have more questions for our guest. Uh, again, Guy Collins, he's a, a extension cotton specialist out of North Carolina. If you have any questions for Guy, please feel free to give us a call, 701-293-9000. That's 701-293-9000. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Uncover unbeatable boat show incentives at Lakeland Dock and Lift. For a limited time, purchase a flow lift and receive a free boat canopy fabric valued up to $5,100 on qualifying lift purchase. Or receive free home crest furniture up to $2,300 with qualifying flow dock purchase. Experience the unparalleled convenience of flow docks and lifts. Hurry in for this limited time offer. Lakeland Dock and Lift, Highway 10, east of Detroit Lakes, or Lakeland General Store, just south of Detroit Lakes in Dunvilla. This Giving Hearts Day, Jail Chaplains is teaming up with local businesses and Christian nonprofits to bring you the 8th Annual Battle of the Churches Chili Cook-Off. Join Jail Chaplains on Thursday, February 8th from 4.30 to 7.30 p.m. at St. Anne in Yoakum Church. This is a free family event with live entertainment, door prizes, and children's games. You can give hope behind bars this Giving Hearts Day with a gift to Jail Chaplains, which will be matched up to $100,000. Learn more about the event and make your gift today through February 8th at jailchaplains.com. Good afternoon, I'm Tom Tucker, WDAY News First. Governor Doug Burgum has announced he will not seek a third term as governor. Burgum was elected to serve as North Dakota's 33rd governor in November 2016 and took office December 15, 2016. He was re-elected to a second term in November 2020. Former President Donald Trump has hinted that Burgum could play a role in a second Trump administration. Former North Dakota State Senator Tom Campbell, meanwhile, has announced his candidacy for governor. Campbell tells WDAY Radio News that an official announcement will be coming in the next two weeks. Campbell left the state Senate to pursue a congressional run but lost in the Republican primary to Kelly Armstrong in June 2018. And economist and political commentator John Lott Jr. says he expects election integrity across the country to be mixed during the 2024 election. You have... Some states which have moved towards uh, uh, having, you know, voter IDs and, uh, and other protections. But you have other states that have moved to uh, uh, mail-in ballots. Lott says other states are also allowing ballot harvesting, which he calls very problematic. Lott also says overall the United States has much looser voting rules compared to most other countries around the world. 
Tom Tucker, WDAY, and WDAYRadioNow.com. The archaeological record suggests that wheat was first cultivated in the regions of the Fertile Crescent, also known as the Cradle of Civilization, around 9600 B.C. The Roman goddess Ceres, who was deemed protector of the grain, gave grains their common name today, cereal. Wheat is the primary grain used in U.S. grain products. Approximately three-quarters of all U.S. grain products are made from wheat flour. The first bagel rolled into the world in 1683 when a baker from Vienna, Austria, was thankful to the king of Poland for saving Austria from Turkish invaders, the baker reshaped the local bread so that it resembled the king's stirrup. The new bread was called bugel, derived from the German word for stirrup. Ancient traditional tortillas were made from ground corn by Mexican natives as long as 2,000 years ago. However, flour tortillas only started to become popular in the 19th century. More types of foods are made with wheat than with any other cereal grain. These farm facts brought to you by the American Ag Network. Encounter Jesus, experience grace at Olivet Lutheran Church. We offer multiple styles of worship services. Our Sunday morning 8.30 worship is filled with traditional hymns led by the organ. If contemporary music is more your style, the Sunday morning 10.30 service will be what you're looking for. And our Wednesday 6 p.m. service is quiet, contemplative, and acoustic. Worship with us online on our YouTube channel. To find out more, visit olivet.org. Encounter Jesus, experience grace at Olivet Lutheran Church. This is Weather and Ag in Focus with Bridget Riedel, Justin Storm, and Dean Wysocki. And welcome back to Weather and Ag in Focus. We're rejoining our conversation with Guy Collins, North Carolina Extension Cotton Specialist. And if you got some questions for Guy or for us, give us a call on the Red Wing Shoes phone line. That's 701-293-9000. And before we went to a bottom of the hour break there, kind of touching on a little bit about planting and uh, the weather that cotton is suitable for. But what happens after we get the cotton seed in the ground? What's the growing period look like for this? What are you doing for fertilizers? or amendments to the soil to ensure that you get a good crop or is it just kind of a plant it and forget it thing all right so yes uh, we we don't certainly don't plant and forget it it's a very high management crop um, so one of our biggest challenges is weed control and that occurs naturally earlier in the season and we have progressed over the years to an approach that relies on residual herbicides basically preventative measures uh, we're combating herbicide resistance on many fronts uh, these days, so that's very, very important um, to to just keep those weeds from from emerging and, and becoming a problem. Um, cotton is also um, an entomologist's dream, as they say. Uh, there, there's an insect dynamic, uh, unlike other crops, that is very interesting in cotton. And that starts with thrips, which are a little tiny flea-like insect that feeds on cotton seedlings really as soon as it emerges um, and affects it until we have about four true leaves on it. So, you know, two or three weeks there after we plant, it can be a problem. Um, that's probably the most consistent insect pest that we have. Uh, from there, once we start setting squares, which that's an interesting anecdote about cotton, the, the fruit, as you heard me mention earlier, is called a bowl, but before it blooms, we refer to that as a square. Don't ask me where that terminology came from because it looks nothing like a square. <laughs> uh, but once we start seeing squares on cotton, which will be somewhere in mid-June, uh, plant bugs or ligus insects can become a big problem. And that can last essentially from mid-June all the way until about Labor Day uh, at any time during during the summer months. Uh, periodically, we have problems with bow worms, uh, essentially the same caterpillar as corn earworm uh, that affects cotton. Our traits uh, to control that are working very well right now. Um, so right now, we tip, we don't have a, a problem with bow worms, but that, that could happen uh, every so often, uh, and we encounter that. And aside from that would be uh, pests like stink bugs. Uh, then you have a few occasional pests, um, like spider mites, things like that, aphids maybe. Uh -huh. um, so so the entomology side or the insect management side is, is uh, very important in cotton. As far as fertility goes, um, you, you need your basics, like your nitrogen. We usually use about 90 pounds per acre or so. 
uh, depending on soil type and, and things of that nature. Uh, potash, we need plenty of potash. A little bit of phosphorus, but we typically don't run into low phosphorus problems. Uh, liming, which is done in the off season, uh, we want to make sure our pH is right. Um, similar to other crops, nothing really different there. Mm -hmm. And uh, on our sandier soils, we need a little sulfur from time to time. Gotcha. Okay. Well, Guy, we've got a uh, caller, Joyce. She's on line one. She has a uh, question for you. Joyce, welcome to Weather and Ag and Focus. And what's your question today? I, hi. Well, I've never walked through a cotton plantation, and this may seem silly, but I'm trying to picture the plant itself. And, you know, I have clothes that are 100% cotton and sheets, but I do have cotton balls, you know, in the bag that I use to remove makeup. So the cotton balls are those kind of like what a, a, a the, the plant itself is a looks like cotton balls that you would buy in the store. That, that's a good question. Oh, did you hear um, the, oh. I did. Uh, the, the The cotton balls that you buy in the store is is true cotton, but it's processed cotton. Um, so a, a cotton bowl, uh, which is a harvestable fruit, would be. Uh, a little bit larger, and most bowls will contain four segments, uh, kind of like an orange slice, if you would. And in that cotton is the seed. So the, the cotton fibers arise from the cotton seed. So when a cotton bowl opens, you have these four segments that kind of fluff out, and all you see is the cotton. But once we harvest it, we have to take it to the gin, and that gin... Uh, with the use of saw blades and a lot of other fancy equipment, removes that seed from that lint. So all that's left is the lint. So then the lint is cleaned and woven however we need to. Um, and so what you're seeing in a cotton ball that you buy uh, would be processed cotton that's, that's already been through the ginning process. But very good question. That's really that's very interesting. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joyce. Appreciate that. Yeah, thanks for the call. Yeah. So you were just talking about that there's a big bug issue or can be bug problems with cotton. Um, what would you say is more of a, a permanent or permanent pest? Is it more of the bugs or is it disease? Is cotton a disease-susceptible plant? So cotton does encounter diseases occasionally, but generally speaking, diseases are a fairly minor problem for cotton, at least in my, my part of the, the country. Uh, there are some diseases that uh, periodically can be problematic, uh, one of which is bacterial blight um, that, that can cause severe yield loss on occasion. But luckily, we have modern varieties that are tolerant to, to or resistant to bacterial blight. Um, some other diseases would be foliar type diseases. Um, early in the season, we can have seedling disease, uh, which is rhizoctonia uh, or pythium uh, or common seedling diseases. And basically that can just kill the cotton seedling. A lot of times that's going to be related to field history and cool, wet conditions uh, around the time that we plant. So a lot of times that's avoidable. Uh, and then later in the year, we'll have other foliar diseases, such as uh, uh, one's called target spot, for example, that can cause cotton to prematurely defoliate. A lot of times what we see, though, uh, is that disease only comes in when we have very wet conditions, usually in mid-August through September. And our long Labor Day is when we're going to, we're kind of giving up on on growing the plant and just waiting for it to mature anyway. So when we have those uh, wet conditions that time of year, it doesn't hurt for us to go ahead and lose some of those leaves uh, to get a little bit of airflow down there so that the bowls don't rot and, and things like that. Uh, so a lot of times it can help you, but what you don't want is that disease uh, coming in way too early while we're still actively trying to grow bowls. All right. And Guy, uh, a couple of quick questions. Is is the cotton highly imported or more exported? A large, large majority of our crop is exported. Now, there is some domestic use of cotton. Uh, we do uh, have a few spinning mills uh, remaining. Uh, some make denim, some just you know, 
do various things. A lot of the domestic market nowadays is going to be yarn spinning. And a lot of that is, is driven by machines. Um, so some what we see in the domestic market, a lot of times, especially with yarn spinners, is the yarn will be spun here, but then the yarns are, are shipped overseas, woven or, or knitted into fabrics or even final products and then coming back to the U.S. Uh, to be sold. Uh, but aside from the domestic market, most of it's going to go to China, India, uh, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Turkey. Uh, there's, there's mills all over, but that's where we see uh, most of our, our cotton going. Gotcha. And uh, I've heard it's also used, cotton seed is used as livestock feed. Is that quality feed for nutrition or kind of just more of a filler? It is very good uh, uh, feed value uh, for cattle, especially, and that's both beef cattle and dairy cattle. Mm -hmm. um, it, they can kind of get a, a, if they're eating whole cotton seed, they can get fat, protein, and fiber essentially all in one if they're eating that whole cotton seed. And uh, like we used to raise cattle and that's what we would feed them during the wintertime. And we, we actually would turn cows out on a cotton field to let them kind of clean it up, you know, whatever uh -huh. cotton was left. Uh -huh. And they will pick it clean. They, they love cotton seed. Interesting. Um, so uh -huh. <clears throat> some aren't fed whole cotton seed, but they're, they're fed cotton seed meal, uh, which is everything minus the cotton oil. You know, that's after it's been crushed for oil and it's the byproduct of that. And it's also very, very nutritious for, uh, for cattle. But uh, cotton oil is consumed by humans. I mean, we use that in cooking and the cosmetics industry. Uh, and there's other byproducts, too, that are fairly interesting, like linters, which are the tiny fibers that's left after the ginning process that we can't really, they're not long enough to weave in the fabric. Uh, so it's like the fuzz that's, that's remaining on the seed. Uh, those linters are used as like thickeners and ice cream, things like that. Uh, paper money. Like if you hold up a dollar bill, you'll see uh, some colored fibers mm -hmm. in there. A lot of them are red or blue. Yep. If you look really, really close, you can see them. Uh, so uh, film. So cotton fiber is actually uh, almost pure form of cellulose. It's one of the rarest forms of just cellulose. And it's used in, in things like film. Interesting. Hmm. Never knew Very that. Interesting. <laughs> and, and I got one for you here, guy. Do you what? How do we? How do you measure a successful year when it comes to cotton up here in the Red River Valley of North Dakota? If we're if we hit, uh, say, 40, 45 bushel soybeans, we're we're doing pretty good. If we get two hundred bushel corn, we're looking pretty good. What's what's the cotton in North Carolina look like for a good year? All right. So that's strictly based on yield which is amount per acre that we can produce and quality of that, that fiber um so you know certain uses or end uses have specific uh, parameters that they want to meet in terms of their ability to spin that cotton or weave it or, or knit it uh, fiber length is is one parameter the thickness of the fiber uh, is another one. So like your finer linens, we're going to have long fibers and very thin fibers, uh, but they want that fiber to be strong as well. Uh, we're, we're also graded on color grades, which can be driven by environmental conditions. Um, there are other things uh, as well, uh, like extraneous matter or trash content, leaf content uh, in that lint. Um, that is going to affect the spinning uh, process so we're graded on that as well uh, but the a lot of times what we see are discounts if we're going to encounter a, a fiber quality problem and a lot of that's related to environmental conditions like severe drought for example it's not uncommon to have really thick fibers after we've had a severe drought usually in the month of august uh, but proudly, most years, uh, we're able to avoid a lot of that, and, and we're able to harvest very high-quality cotton. Uh, so aside from quality, we're, we are uh, the measure of success is, is really going to be yield. And most growers will tell you that to break even or to make a little bit of money, you need to be at at least two bales per acre, which will be the equivalent of 1,000 pounds of lint per acre. 
Uh, so anything greater than that is is better economically for us. Um, in modern times, with growers with irrigation, or just get a little bit of timely rain right when they need it, uh, three bales is certainly a realistic possibility, uh, and we can we can be profitable at, at three bales. And occasionally, if we're really lucky, we can we can break four bales. Now that's in our part of the world. Uh, if you get outside of the southeast and mid south, there's other parts that can hit four and five bales quite regularly in those arid environments, but they have to have timely irrigation water. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's super interesting. Well, guy, we're running out of time here, so we got to come and we have to end this conversation. But if anyone wants to follow along on the journey of cotton, you got any social media platforms or do you uh, kind of follow the process at all that you'd like to plug in here? Well, anybody that's interested, I mean, our, our website uh, is cotton.ces, as in Cooperative Extension Service, dot ncsu, which is NC State University, dot edu. It, that website is geared mainly towards producers, but there's other cotton information on there. Cotton Incorporated um, is, is housed right here in North Carolina. They represent the entire cotton industry. And the world headquarters uh, is about an hour from where I am right now. And they do some really cool things um, from marketing uh, to designer uh, issues and, and trends uh, to spinning and things like that. My part comes in with ag research. They fund a lot of the research that we do uh, that is, is here to help growers. Uh, but their website, cottoninc.com, uh, is a very good resource. You can find a lot of good information on um, all things cotton on, on their website. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Guy, and we hope you have a great rest of the year. And with the crop coming up, when we come back, we got another check on the forecast. Any last-minute questions you might have, 701-293-9000 is the Red Wing Shoes phone line. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Happy Harry's presents North Dakota's largest boat marine product show, January 26th through the 28th at the Fargo Dome. See all the latest gear, all under one roof. It's the Boat Marine Product Show, January 26th through the 28th at the Fargo Dome. I'm Mike with Jail Chaplains. We believe no inmate walks alone. Right now, there are hundreds of broken men and women sitting in the Cass County Jail looking for hope. We know that hope is found in Jesus Christ. He is transforming lives and setting people free through Jail Chaplains. You can give hope behind bars this Giving Hearts Day with a gift to Jail Chaplains, which will be matched up to $100,000. Please consider making your gift today through February 8th at jailchaplains.com. Giving Hearts Day is just around the corner. This year, a generous donor has stepped up to match every single Ann Carlson Center donation up to $1 million. You can give your gift in advance now through April 8th by visiting givingheartsday.org and selecting Ann Carlson Center. Your generosity this year will again further our mission and help provide necessary resources for individuals with developmental disabilities or delays across North Dakota. For more details, head over to givingheartsday.org. Ann Carlson, where every heart counts. At Holson Home and Solar, we believe in the power of a smart home. Safeguard your peace of mind with our state-of-the-art security cameras, keyless door access codes, and monitoring systems. Experience the future with audio-video excellence and home automation that adapts to your lifestyle. In a world that's changed, elevate your surroundings, enhance your security, and embrace the future. Holson Home and Solar, where innovation meets peace of mind. Call 218-78-SOLAR today. Happy Harry's presents North Dakota's largest boat marine product show, January 26th through the 28th at the Fargo Dome. See all the latest gear, all under one roof. It's the Boat Marine Product Show, January 26th through the 28th at the Fargo Dome. If you have unfiled taxes or are in debt to the IRS, this is important news. The IRS just rolled out a new program to help struggling taxpayers more easily resolve their tax problems. It's called the Taxpayer Relief Initiative, and it opens up powerful new options for people looking to get back on the right track with the IRS. And no one knows this program like the professionals at Optima Tax Relief, America's most trusted tax resolution company. They've resolved over $1 billion in tax debt for their clients and have the expertise and experience 
experience to help you. One easy call to Optima can start the process, helping to put an end to your worries of wage garnishment, asset seizure, and other aggressive IRS actions. Make today the beginning of your fresh start with the IRS. Call the experts at Optima Tax Relief now for your free confidential consultation. Call 800-343-6460. 800-343-6460. 800-343-6460. Optima Tax Relief. Some restrictions apply. For complete details, please visit OptimaTaxRelief.com. Weather and Ag in Focus on WGAY Radio. And welcome back to Weather and Ag in Focus. I want to thank you for joining us on this Monday, January 22nd afternoon. Uh, let's do a quick mm-hmm. recap of weather because uh, we don't really have a whole lot of time. Uh, tomorrow, we'll probably be giving, well, we will be giving away some boat tickets, uh, boat show tickets mm-hmm. tomorrow. Uh, but right now, there is some light snow on radar uh, just south of Cooperstown, Valley City area as well. But the more confined uh, light snow stretches from about Buxton through Grand Forks and then stretching into areas of northwestern Minnesota, uh, up around Argyle, and uh, stretching uh, up towards uh, the Lancaster area of northwest Minnesota as well. Most of this is pretty light, but there are some pockets of some more moderate uh, snow showers. And down towards uh, the 94 corridor here, as these little... uh, uh, areas of light preset move east. We could even mix in a little bit of sleet with that as well. This is not going to be a problem in terms of uh, travel. So uh, if you're out and about this afternoon, a few flakes, maybe a few ice pellets or sleet mixed in there uh, from the 94 corridor out into Lakes Country. And then that's all mainly just light snow uh, as you head uh, from Hillsboro and points northward. And uh, again, this will be moving out and east of the valley here by about 3, 3.30 this afternoon. Then we should have quiet conditions, that looks like, for the majority of the rest of the afternoon and into the evening. Temps in the 20s today, a little cooler in the northern valley in the teens. And then we'll all drop down into the teens tonight. And then tomorrow, a lot of cloud cover around uh, upper 20s, mid to upper 20s tomorrow. And then we're in the 30s, about mid-30s for Wednesday. And Thursday and Friday, we'll... Cool it down, if you will, but still remain above normal in the low 30s. And then we're in the 30s this weekend and into uh, the start of next week. So not a bad forecast, uh, with especially after the last 10 days that we had of some uh, pretty darn cold temperatures around here. We're going to get a little break from this. And again, according to the LRC, uh, we're going to uh, see some colder weather coming in here uh, as we head into early February. So we're not quite done uh, by any stretch of the imagination with the cold weather. But, uh, hey, I mean, if, if that 10-day stretch in January is the coldest we get this winter, I don't think many people are going to be doing too much complaining. You know what? It wasn't even that cold. It really Not for here. Now, areas of the Central Plains and down into the Ohio Valley, it was record-setting for them. It was. But for us, uh, this is just that's a cold winter. Cold that's win- just another Just a day. cold snap. <laughs> it's just, you know? <laughs> It is just a cold snap. So I'm going to have a – we will post this online uh, tomorrow right before Weather and Ag and Focus. I've got a riddle, and if you solve it, you've got to solve it with the correct answer. And, again, we'll post this on our Facebook page uh, tomorrow right before before WAG. If you can solve it, we'll be giving away a rain gauge and a pair of boat tickets for tomorrow. I was, uh, one of my friends posted this. It stumped me twice. I got it on the third try. <laughs> so that's something to look forward to uh, for tomorrow. Very so, for, yeah. So for me and Justin, uh, Bridget has a day off today. She's taking a little uh, rest and relaxation time, and it's well deserved for her. So for Justin and myself, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, don't go anywhere. Jay's got an exciting topic we're, that me and him are going to be discussing. That's on the Jay Thomas Show. Coming up next. Hello, Fargo.